Groundwater Research Center. And I'm really uh, delighted for, for three reasons today. Actually, first, uh, I, I have the opportunity to introduce Professor uh, Masaki Hayashi, uh, whom I, I know, I have known since uh, we are doing uh, my postdoc at the University of Waterloo, and Masaki at the same time was doing his PhD. And, um, and we both are the same supervisor, you know, Nick Rudolph. Uh, and most recently, we had the opportunity to, to work together at the Guelph University, and uh, Masaki is professor at the Guelph. And um, I was visiting the professor uh, with uh, Kathy Wright. But, but the second is the great audience that we received uh, for this presentation. And uh, unfortunately, we could not accept everybody that uh, registered, but uh, tried to register. And showing that the uh, groundwater topic is a uh, really uh, very attractive thing, you know? and either by importance because I think it's related to various aspects of our sustainability and life. Oh, and the third is not the least. Uh, know that Masaki was the great winner of the uh, 2018 uh, NGWA Darcy Lecture Award. Uh, this award is the most important in our field of groundwater, and uh, you can see from his presentation that he really deserved this, this, this prize. Yeah? And, uh, but uh, this event was made possible uh, thanks to NGWA, the National, United States National Groundwater Association. And uh, I want to really thanks, uh, thank them. And also thank uh, the CEPAS, our center, and uh, our staff. Um, and the support that we received from three Brazilian associations. First, the Groundwater Brazilian Association, um, the Society of Geology, and the Brazilian Society of Geology, and also the Brazilian Association of Engineering um, Geology. Uh, well, to all my, my thanks. And uh, well, I think that uh, it's time to invite uh, uh, Masaki to start speaking. Uh, yeah, basically the idea is to have um, this presentation, and after that, uh, time for questions. Any suggestions? Ah, oh, sorry, not Belfa. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's, it's, no, no, I, 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 I have to explain. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, it's a Canadian university, too. And, uh, well, and, and because CEPAS has a very strong project at the uh, Guelph University, too. And we study Waterloo and Macau. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's, actually, it's another other place. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, yeah. the West and other you know, East. Okay. But right. please, okay. thank you, well, Masaki. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Ricardo, for a very kind uh, introduction. And uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, everybody for being here. It's my uh, great pleasure to be here at the University of uh, Sao Paulo. Um, I uh, arrived uh, on Friday afternoon and uh, spent a few days with uh, Ricardo and Amelia and their family. It's uh, uh, yeah, a great city and a great place to be. So like Ricardo said, uh, this Darcy Lecture Tour is uh, sponsored by the National Groundwater Association. Uh, so it's uh, purpose is to uh, foster interest and excellence uh, in uh, groundwater science and technology. Uh, you know, just like you know we're doing now. So we'd like to <coughs> promote groundwater science uh, to uh, many people around the world. Uh, so since 1987, uh, that's the lecture series has reached out to more than 85,000 people around the uh, world. Um, so Henry Darcy uh, was a uh, prominent scientist and water resource engineer in France, in a city called Dijon. So the biggest achievement uh, of Darcy was to establish a, a high quality water supply system uh, to the city. This was back in 1800s. And then since uh, establishment of water supply system, Darcy had uh, worked on uh, water resources, uh, looking at groundwater, and also thinking about the pipes for distributing uh, water to different places. So 
from those years of observation, he came up with this idea that flow of water through a medium uh, like sand is proportional to what we know now as the hydraulic gradient. And then he conducted this famous uh, experiment uh, in uh, 1855, just three years before he died from pneumonia, uh, to establish uh, what we know now as Darcy's law. This is the foundation of just about everything we do in uh, groundwater science, <coughs> uh, including uh, today's uh, uh, topic, uh, which is looking at groundwater in a high elevation environment. Uh, so we call it alpine. Basically, what it means is elevation higher than the limit of the tree growth. So that's alpine in today's definition. So this is a lake um, near Calgary in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. Uh, so it's a high elevation lake, so you can see some glaciers uh, hanging over lakes, over the cliff of this uh, steep uh, rocks. So this is one of uh, the hundreds of uh, headwater basins of a um, big river system called the Saskatchewan River. So Saskatchewan River is the uh, source of water supply for many millions of people living in the region called Canadian prairies, uh, which is a dry region. Um, so we, in the prairies, uh, look to the mountains as the uh, water tower, the source of water. And then that situation uh, is common in many places around the world. For example, this map shows in red the regions that produce disproportionately large amount of runoff compared to the downstream regions. So, so most of these red regions are in the mountains. For example, this is the, uh, this is the Andes. So there is Chile, mm -hmm. Bolivia, Peru. So these countries have very dry regions. So the people living in these dry regions of Peru, Bolivia, and Chile, and part of Argentina as well, they are relying on these <coughs> mountains as their water power. In fact, about 40% of the world's population is relying on mountains as uh, the water power. So I'm just zooming into uh, Canada here. Um, so it's a, a map of Canada with annual precipitation <coughs> in different colors. So I mean, Calgary, so it's uh, this dot here. We're actually in the driest part of the country. So we only receive about 300 to 400 millimeter of annual precipitation. But we have this region um, in a red, uh, black and green color. So that's the region that receives lots of precipitation because of the mountains. So in the next slide, I'll show you uh, the graph of river discharge in a popular uh, tourist uh, place called uh, Banff. So this uh, graph uh, shows uh, discharge uh, measure in cubic meter per second in Banff. Uh, so I'm showing just an example of uh, last six years. So you see that uh, in summer um, here, we have lots of interannual variability, so the amount of flow differs from year to year. And that's because the amount of flow in summer is determined by the amount of snow in the mountains and how fast it's melting. But aside from this four months in summer, the rest of the year, the flow is uh, relatively stable. And it's uh, almost primarily provided by the groundwater discharge. And that's because in Canada, winter is very cold. After the end of October, the, all the precipitation comes in the form of snow, and it does not melt until the end of April. So this <coughs> shows you the importance of uh, groundwater in feeding the headwaters of the, the rivers. So the groundwater um, discharge uh, to the headwaters uh, continues year round. So in Canada, the winter is a very important one. There's no other <coughs> source of water. But in dry regions of the world, such as in Peru and Bolivia, it's a dry season when you don't get much precipitation. 
that's when the rivers need to rely on groundwater input. And then groundwater input has a major ecological function uh, sustaining the habitat for fish and other aquatic species. <coughs> and also in, it's important for the human water use. So this is a mountainous region in uh, Nepal. Uh, this is Annapurna Mountains. Uh, so this is the middle of the dry season. Yet this river has some water flowing. And this weir here is not just a <coughs> weir, it's actually part of the hydropower generation system. So here in Brazil we have Itaipu, another big, big power generation system using dams. But countries like Nepal, they don't have a lot of money and infrastructure, so they rely on this type of system it's for the run of river hydropower generation. So it's a low cost and it's suitable for countries like Nepal. So this and thousands of other micro hydropower generators are, are sending electricity to light, uh, to light this uh, mountain mm -hmm. lakes. But this is only possible with, with groundwater discharge to the headwater of this uh, river. And then groundwater is also important uh, for the mountain ecosystem. Uh, for example, this is the driest part of China, western part of uh, China. It's called Tianqian Mountains. So it's a very dry mountain in the middle of the dry season, but we still get this green vegetation because of groundwater providing moisture to this valley floor. So the mountains are considered the water columns, uh, mainly because of the, its ability to store precipitation in the form of snow and ice. When I ice, uh, it means glaciers. With global Warming. Uh, there are lots of reports uh, talking about the changes in the pattern of hydrology in the mountains. For example, it's expected that mountains will have a shallower snowpack because we get more rain than snow, and also the snow melt timing will be earlier in the future. And then there are also uh, Numerous uh, reports uh, saying that the mountain glaciers are shrinking or even disappearing. Uh, for example, this paper uh, by a, uh, colleagues uh, of us say that about 70% of glaciers uh, in Western Canada will be gone by year 2100. And then there are also lots of reports uh, comparing the amount of glacier melt to the amount of water coming down uh, during the summer month. Uh, one example is a uh, paper from Switzerland. So this is part of the uh, glacier system in Switzerland. So about 10% of all that's flow in the Rhine River, which is a big river uh, flowing through uh, the city of uh, Basel, uh, is <coughs> provided by the glacier melt. Now, Lots of these studies uh, comparing glacier melt to the river flow make one important assumption, which is the glacier melt is equal to the summer flow contribution. So in other words, the ice, when it melts, that is instantly going into the river system, no transit time. And some of us in this room are studying groundwater, and we know that is not true. So the transit time could be only a few weeks, maybe a few months, but there is a transit time. So it's not like glacial melt is going straight into the river channel. So the big question for us is to understand the role of the groundwater in buffering the, the effects of uh, climate change. So in the next uh, little while, so I'm going to show you some of small contributions that our group in Calgary <coughs> has been making towards answering this uh, big question. So I'd like to introduce some of our uh, research uh, team members. And first and foremost, uh, this is Professor Larry Bentley, uh, my colleague. He is a near surface geophysicist. Uh, so he is someone who's using geophysical tool to look at the condition <coughs> The shallow subsurface, usually down to about you know, 20, 30 meters, sometimes 100 meters. 
So Larry um, designed and conducted all the geophysical campaigns. So a lot of results I'm showing was possible because of Larry. And then there are dedicated uh, team of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows uh, who took this on as part of graduate thesis or the postdoctoral projects. And there are a lot more, many more students, mainly undergraduate students, uh, who came out to the field both in summer and cold winter to help us gather the data in a very challenging environment. So all these results I'm going to show you in a minute wouldn't have been possible by all the students uh, who did a, a hard work. So I would like to start the main part of my talk with this uh, little story. So this picture uh, shows uh, a Lake Ohara. So it's an, uh, another lake in the mountains. Um, so it's considered the most beautiful place in the Canadian Rockies uh, by many guidebooks. So this picture, I took this picture in the, uh, September of 2003, um, almost 15 years ago. At the time, I was asked to come out with uh, a little device, uh, it's called the EM device, uh, to map the salinity of uh, groundwater around uh, a uh, uh, lodge near this beautiful lake. It's a device you can kind of sling from your shoulder and read the numbers and map the groundwater salinity. So it's a routine uh, task. So my student and I went there and they finished the job in two hours. So we had a whole afternoon to explore this uh, beautiful lake. So I am a hydrologist, so when I go to a new site, uh, I carry this uh, flow meter. It's a device you can put in the river and measure the flow rate. So my student and I walked around this lake and then noted that there were four small streams carrying water into the lake. And we measured flow in all these inflow streams. And we also know that there's one stream uh, carrying water from the, the lake. And we discovered that when you add up inflow from all the four streams, that's only about a half of water going out of the lake. And I was really you know, curious, what's going on? So this is 15 years ago, and back then the, the paradigm or the, the, you know, the accepted theory was that in an environment like this, when there's a no soil, it just exposed bedrocks, there really shouldn't be any groundwater processes in this type of environment. It's actually called a Teflon basin. So the groundwater does not stick in a place like this. But, you know, we were really curious, you know, well, is there a groundwater in such an environment? And how is that possible? So I uh, recruited uh, the bright uh, young uh, undergraduate student, uh, Jamie Hood, to take this on as a little project, just something, some little thing undergraduate students do to graduate. So what Jamie did was a very simple idea. Well, we know that there are some streams bringing water into this lake, and there's a stream bringing water out. And we can also measure rainfall during the summer months, and we can estimate evaporation. So if there is no groundwater input or output, then the amount of surface water input should be equal to the surface water output on average. So Jamie set up this program, so she monitored uh, stream flow all summer, and we borrowed a uh, rain gauge, uh, because we had zero budget for this project when we started. This was just a little underground project. And then this is what uh, Jamie saw. <coughs> so the green uh, is output, and the blue is input. So there was clearly a lot more output than <coughs> input throughout the season. So really what's happening is the difference is made up by what we call net groundwater input. So it's a difference between groundwater inflow and the groundwater outflow. So um, th this was a kind of you know, new discovery. Well, there's a groundwater in such an environment. So I encourage Jamie to 
light up a little paper, and then we got it published in a scientific journal. So that gave us a sort of like a motivation to actually go after major research uh, funding, research money, to start up a new project. So we set up a, a study, uh, it's called a hydrological observatory. So this is a place we observe hydrology using lots of instruments. So it's located in a uh, place uh, here. So this is Canada here and the United States here, Mexico here. It's in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. It's near another famous uh, tourist resort uh, called the Lake Louise. So the entire basin uh, was uh, 14 kilometers squared, but we thought it was just too large. So we decided to focus on the sub watershed for the Pauline uh, watershed. Uh, and then, so when we started working uh, here, this is what we saw. <coughs> we had no idea how groundwater uh, um, existed and how it flowed and how it was stored. And then 15 years later, we now have some understanding of our groundwater processes. So we use this concept called a hydrogeological response unit. So it's a different geological unit that respond differently to the input of snow melt and rainwater. So for example, we have this uh, bedrock, exposed bedrock. It's a Cambrian quartzite. It's a very hard rock. It uh, doesn't have a lot of fractures, so it's a pretty tight. In fact, this is a Teflon rock uh, uh, here. And then we have a talus. Uh, so it's the, the slope formed by the rock fall deposits uh, from uh, the steep cliffs over many years. And then we have uh, this alpine meadow. So that's the area where you, you see vegetation growing, the green areas. So no trees, no mostly uh, grassy vegetation. And then we have uh, this pro-glacial moraine. So this is uh, actually a small glacier here. So this part is snow covered, but you can kind of see ice exposed here. And then this glacier had several advances uh, over the last you know, maybe tens of thousands of years. And then the last advance occurred during the time period called the Little Ice Age. So that's when the temperature of the planet was much colder, about 200 to 300 years ago. And so this glacier kind of pushed up to this point, and then when it left, uh, it retrieved, uh, it uh, left this package of material called the pro-glacial moraine. And then we noticed that uh, there was a spring <coughs> here, and then this creek, Opagin Creek, was coming out of this uh, spring. So this is a picture of the source spring here. And we also noted that there was a lake here. So this is dammed up by this uh, hard quartzite, and then behind the lake is the uh, moraine here. So when we you know, do hydrogeological studies, normally the primary tool is the drilling and sampling rocks and putting wells to observe the groundwater levels. But in this environment, it's very hard to do that. Well, most, well, first, it's going to be very expensive bringing drilling on helicopters. Also, this is in the national park. So our parks administration will never allow us to drill in this environment. So we have to use alternative tools. So here we decided to look at the interaction between groundwater and the surface water and then learn about groundwater from observing interaction. So in the next slide, I will show you the graph of the spring discharge from this uh, headwater spring. So this is from uh, June to uh, September. And you know, the snow melt season lasts until the end of uh, July. So during the snow melt, we have a lot more water coming out of the spring. It's also variable too, but after the snow melt is done, it was stable flow regime, punctuated by response to summer rain. 
And then this is basically the release of uh, groundwater stored in the moray. So this was you know, fed by the snowmelt water mainly. And then I'll just uh, superimpose the water level in Opavin Lake. So there is a strong correlation, and which was no surprise. Um, so what's shown here is basically Darcy's law. So the hydraulic kept uh, in the lake goes up, that increases the gradient, that pushes the flow at a greater rate uh, in, the, uh, in the stream. So what this tells us is that there is a groundwater pathway or hydraulic connection between Opadian Lake and this spring. And what it also implies is that there must be other groundwater pathways uh, so from the glacier to the spring or from the other part of the moraine to the spring because we, we see no surface water features, uh, no streams on the moraine. So we realize that uh, we really need to understand the internal structure of this moraine. And again, we cannot drill, so we needed to use alternative method instead of drilling. So we uh, <coughs> decided to use a geophysical method. So th this is how the moraine looks like. Our objective is to see inside. So we use uh, several different techniques. So this is called the electrical resistivity tomography. So we put two electrodes. Uh, like this is basically a big nail. So just put the nail in between the rocks and then push the electrical current from one electrode to another. So that generates electrical potential field. Basically, it's a voltage field generated by the shooting uh, electrical current. So by measuring this voltage field using many electrodes in the area, and repeating that many, many times, we can construct tomographic image uh, using computer programs of electrical resistivity underground. So that's called the uh, resistivity tomography. We also use seismic refraction tomography. So this student here is hitting this uh, raw, uh, thick plastic plate with a big hammer. So we hit the plastic plate many, many times using uh, this sledgehammer and recording the trouble of the seismic waves using many, many sensors. And then we can construct a tomographic image of the hardness of material uh, underground. So I'll show you first the results of the seismic refraction tomography along this red line here. So blue color is a low seismic velocity, meaning a soft material, and uh, orange and red is a high velocity, meaning uh, intact hard rock material. And then these black uh, <coughs> lines uh, show the pathway of the seismic uh, waves. So you can clearly see that there is a sharp boundary between the soft material here and the hard rock. So basically this is a moraine about 20 to 30 meters thick and the by this hard Cambrian quartzite uh, bedrock. And then we run the resistivity on the same line. And then in this picture, the uh, red is high resistivity and blue is low resistivity. So in this particular environment, high resistivity is an indication of either dry material or frozen material. So the highest value of resistivity was uh, recorded in this area which turns out to be a big slab of ice. So it's basically the extension of a glacier, but it's covered by these rocks. So this is important because the glaciers, you know, when you see it from satellite images and uh, air photos, you only see the ice part of the glacier, but there's actually a large frontal part of the glacier that's hidden by thin veneer of uh, rocks. 
<coughs> and ice is melting there as well. And then there are other parts. Okay? So this is high resistivity, but not that high. So this orange patches. So based on other measurements, uh, we concluded that these are ground ice or permafrost. So this is a permanently frozen water uh, ice in between these big rocks. So the size of the rocks in this place is about the size of, we have this table or even bigger. So these are big rocks, and then there's some ice in between these big rocks. That's ground ice. And then, oh, sorry. And then we have a transition from this yellow area to the greenish blue area. So indicating there is a transition from uh, wet to the dry to wet. And then all geophysical techniques or methods have uh, limitations. So limitation of this particular method, the resistivity tomography, is that when we have high resistivity material on top of low resistivity material, it really masks the <coughs> resolution of the low, low resistivity material. So we can tell that there's some wetness underneath this line, but we don't really know if this wet zone is one meter thick or ten meter thick. So when we have this you know, unresolved program, we need to bring in another line of evidence, independent line of evidence. So we were lucky to uh, bring in our friends uh, from Switzerland to run a nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. So there is a medical device called MRI. So it's the same principle, but it's applied at a much bigger scale. So this MRI technique uh, shows the presence of a liquid water molecule. So <clears throat> they detected this thin layer of water molecules sitting here. And then it was sitting right above the uh, quartzite bedrock surface we detected using seismic imaging. So based on all these multiple lines of evidence, we were able to cons construct a conceptual model of groundwater flow and storage in uh, pro-glacial uh, moraine. So um, in this picture, so we have this glacier, part of that is covered by rocks, and then there is some permafrost. So in the glacier and the permafrost, Groundwater cannot flow. It's impermeable to uh, water. So the water has to find the breaks in between permafrost, and then it percolates down vertically. And then it reaches the hard bedrock surface, and then starts flowing laterally to uh, the lake and also the spring. And sometimes uh, groundwater pops up uh, in a little Pond. In the alpine environment, it's called a tarn. A tarn is a little pond <coughs> in the uh, alpine. <coughs> so it was nice to get this conceptual understanding of uh, groundwater in the uh, alpine. But in the hydrogeology, we don't like to talk about numbers, you know, how much groundwater is there, or how fast it's flowing. And then typically, if we can drill, we put the well and do some testing. Uh, but then we cannot do that here. So we decided, again, to rely on surface water, groundwater interaction work. So we decided to use this little tarn as a window uh, into uh, groundwater. So the idea is this. So this is a picture of uh, the tarn. It's not a very large pond. So we want to do Darcy's law here. So if we can measure the groundwater inflow and outflow rate into this pond, and then we know how to measure the hydraulic head in this pond. So we should be able to back calculate uh, hydraulic conductivity using Darcy's law. So the problem here, OK, so we, wanted to do the water balance, similar to the very first result I showed you. In the first result, all I, we needed to know was the net groundwater inflow, so inflow minus outflow. We didn't really need to separate inflow and outflow. But here, we needed to know both inflow and 
out of flow. So there are two knowns. So the water balance equation just gives you one. So we have to use two equations. So we use the water balance equation in combination with the energy balance. So energy balance, again, is a simple concept. So during the day, the, the sunlight gets this pond. So it warms the water in the pond. But at the same time, there is cold groundwater flowing through the pond. So by measuring the temperature of the pond water, we can actually gather some information about groundwater inflow and outflow. So this is our energy balance uh, setup. So there's all sorts of sensors attached to this power. And then this is our little evaporation pan. It looks like this. It's just a bucket on a raft with a bunch of uh, sensors to ensure that the temperature in the bucket is the same as temperature outside of the bucket. And we also wanted to be sure, so we decided to run the third equation in the form of a tracer mass balance. So we done a sodium chloride tracer in the form and watched the concentration. So going in, we knew that the concentration of sodium chloride is not going to be uniform in the pond. So we measure the concentration in many, many places and use average concentration of uh, chloride. So I mean, it's plotted right here. So it decayed exponentially. So basically, <coughs> uh, with time. So basically, this is running a borehole dilution test, but it's a, a very large scale. So based on these measurements, uh, so we got, in this case, groundwater outflow versus uh, depth of water in the pond. So the red dot is a combination of water balance and energy balance. And the black dots are a combination of water and uh, chloride mass balance. So we do see a linear relationship. But this is not a simple one-dimensional column used by Darcy. So it's a complex three-dimensional flow system. So we needed to run a three-dimensional groundwater flow model to establish a theoretical relationship between the depth of water and the groundwater outflow for different value of outflow. And with this, uh, we were able to constrain the value of the hydraulic conductivity within an order of uh, magnitude. So this doesn't sound like a very accurate measurement. We're still looking at water management. But for hydrogeology of complex system like this, um, one order of magnitude is actually a very good constraint uh, on the value. So I have told you a lot about characterization of this particular hydrogeological response unit, namely pro-glacial moraine. Uh, just because I want to show you how we can get some meaningful information about groundwater in a very challenging environment without you know, even drilling up a well. But this is just one example. We have a lot of other hydrogeological response units uh, that we need to characterize. So this is one example. Uh, it's a talus slope and then Alpine meadow. So the talus slope and the alpine meadow seem to occur in the combination. We call it the talus meadow complex. So this is alpine meadow. It's uh, flat, and then it's looking over the meadow from the top of the talus slope. Then we did a similar study, you know, lots of geophysical imaging, and also did lots of hydrological measurements. And interesting thing we saw was uh, this. So this is a map, elevation map, of the bedrock surface, not the elevation map of the ground surface, so which would have been very, very flat. So underneath this flat alpine meadow, about five to six meters deep of fine sediments, and there was a bowl-shaped bedrock basin. And there was a dam here. So that is basically holding groundwater in the basin, so keeping the water table high even during the dry summer months so that this vegetation can grow in this meadow. So this is our 
conceptual model of a uh, talus uh, metal complex. So we have uh, this steep bedrock cliff generating all this rock fall material, and that forms talus. This is very coarse, so the snow melt and rainwater vertically infiltrate and fix this bedrock surface. And then percolates down. Sometimes it shows up as a spring at the toe of the talus slope, and sometimes the groundwater goes straight into this middle. And then the key is this subsurface dam holding the water up there. And it turns out that other researchers around the world are seeing similar things. For example, this is a recent study from uh, uh, Sierra Nevada in California, in a place called the Yosemite National Park in uh, San Francisco, by a group led by Chris Gorey. So they just know that this, you know, the subsurface dam is a very important feature for storing uh, groundwater. And then this is not just North American continent. Uh, we see examples all over the world, uh, particularly in Latin America. So this is an example from Bolivia. <coughs> so we have this talus slope, and the stream is coming out of this talus slope, and feeding the sensitive ecosystem of this uh, creek uh, year around. And this is another example from uh, Peru, very similar system uh, to ours. <coughs> and this is one that I was involved in Switzerland, and we start seeing the same feature in all the mountains around the world. And then <coughs> there are other systems. Um, so this is another place uh, we looked at recently. Uh, so this is uh, Lake Ohara. So it's just about 30 kilometers north of Lake Ohara in the Canadian Rockies as well. So this is the feature we wanted to look at. And it's called the rock pressure. Uh, so it's a you know, particular type of uh, sediment uh, that you find in a high elevation environment. And it looks like this on the ground. So this is a talus slope coming under this uh, steep <coughs> bedrock cliff. And then at one point you know, in history, when the climate was much colder, it's, uh, this place uh, it's estimated that was about 13,000 years ago. So the uh, rock fall deposit started to mix with the snow. And there was a lot of snow and the temperature was lower. So the snow became ice. So the rock ice mixture had enough mass to start flowing. And then it left this characteristic uh, topography now we know as a rock glacier. So there's not much ice left in this rock glacier. Uh, this, this form <coughs> is the remnant of when this rock was flowing with ice. So we run again uh, lots of geophysics and then found that uh, there was a downslope flow of uh, groundwater uh, coming down. And then there was the underground feature. So it's a lateral feature collecting this groundwater flow <coughs> at this point. Uh, all underneath this uh, rock glacier material. And it was guiding the flow to this uh, big spring at the toe of uh, rock glacier. And it just uh, come out at a single point. And then this spring has uh, water flowing out year round and fairly constant temperature between one degree and three degrees Celsius, regardless of the season. And then it provides the, a stable temperature a habitat for a fish. Now, in this particular creek, um, there was a population of uh, trout that is considered endangered species in Canada. So that was <coughs> done by looking at the DNA by our uh, biology uh, colleagues. So this endangered population of trout exists because of this uh, groundwater discharge from this one spring. So this can kind of show you an example of the importance of groundwater in a uh, mountain uh, ecosystem. So this is our conceptual model of this rock pressure. So we again have 
see bedrock cliff and talus slope forming. And then you found is this the main part of the rock glacier. And surprisingly, there are still some ice left, patches of ice left, um, most of the talus and rock glacier as well. Even though this rock glacier was formed many thousands of years ago, and ice is almost gone, but there are some pockets where the energy balance has this property of keeping ice intact after many thousands of years. And then groundwater is flowing over this <coughs> bedrock surface, and then hit this uh, glacial fill. So this is the material left by ice glacier many thousands of years ago. It contains some clay-sized material, so the water cannot flow through, so that instead it flows laterally and pops up at the spring. So in the next slide, I will show you the hydrograph of this spring and hydrograph of its main channel of uh, Helen Creek. And so this is daily precipitation. And this is a map showing the contributing area of the main channel of the Heron Creek in red and the rock glacial spring in blue. So during the summer months, when the response of these systems are dominated by the direct input of rainfall and snow melt. So the flow is roughly proportional to the size of contributing area. But in the end of summer, so the situation changes. So all of a sudden, now, the rock glacier spring becomes the dominant source of water for this system. And in fact, when we go out there in the middle of winter, the main channel here is almost dry, but the rock glacier spring provides year-round flow. Now, so this blue line is all groundwater discharge. Okay? Uh, but yet, you know, you have this steep recession. The flow declines very fast in summer and fall like that. <laughs> slow in winter. So there are, seems to be a two-step response of uh, groundwater. So we're looking at the processes that are responsible for the two-step response. And you know we see this two-step response in the regions other than Alpine. So this might be happening in the places around here as well. So in our system, we have this very coarse sediments sitting on top of bedrock. Um, the top part of bedrock might be fractured. Not very deep, but there's some fractured part. And then when there is a lot of snow melt and rainfall, so the water table is in this uh, coarse setting. So the flow is fast, but it also declines fast. And then in the fall, so this bedrock basins, okay, so this is a bedrock topography. Now this bedrock depression is disconnected from this bedrock depression on top. So the only way groundwater can get through from this depression to that depression is by the drainage through uh, fracture <coughs> to the slow flow. So that could be responsible for this two-step response. Or maybe we have the coarse material, uh, and then at the bottom of the coarse material, there's some finer material. And then underneath it's a bedrock. So in summer and spring, the water table is in this coarse material. And then in the fall and winter, the water table is in this fine material that has a low hydraulic conductivity, or in hydrogeology, we, we call it that transmissivity. So it's called a transmissivity feedback. So this could explain this two step response. So we're still investigating this, but <coughs> there seems to be this. Processes. Now, so this rock glacier is a common feature around the world. For example, this is my colleague uh, in China, so we're there a few years ago at the toll of this rock glacier here, looking at groundwater discharging out as a big spring. So this rock glacier here is located within a Tibetan plateau. That's a very common area uh, within what we call a permafrost zone in the world. So this rock glacier here still has lots of ice and flowing. And <coughs> there's like lots of groundwater coming, coming out. But the rock glacier doesn't have to have active ice in it. In fact, this is the one from uh, Austria. So this is again rock glacier, but ice was gone many thousands of 
years. There's no ice left in this landscape, but you still have this sediment characteristic of your glacier. And some of the sediments actually have trees growing, but yet, because of high porosity of this material, you've got this <coughs> stream coming out from the base of the uh, rock glacier. And then that was the last the headwater, <coughs> the water supply to the water streams. <coughs> now, so all this is interesting, um, you know, looking at hydrogeological response to and talking about connection between hydrology and geology. But really, that's not what we are interested in. So our interest is you know, collecting the behavior of these different hydrogeological responses. So how does that control the water coming out of a watershed? So the idea is that we have different types of water sources, for example, snow melt, summer rain, and a little bit of glacier melt. So that is all going into the collection of the hydrogeological response. And then when it comes up, it has been changed. So this change all happens hydrogeologically. So we would like to characterize this <coughs> response. So a, uh, we want to characterize the temporary storage of the groundwater at a watershed scale. So we decided what we want to do a water balance study for a watershed. But it turns out that was a very challenging task because when we do hydrogeology in the flatland, precipitation input is one of the, the easiest things to measure, at least in theory. But that's not so in the mountains. Uh, for example, this map is a small watershed. Okay, well, it's only about five kilometers squared. And then this map shows the amount of uh, what we call the snow water equivalent. So that's amount of snow on the ground expressed as the depth of water when it's melted, snow water equivalent. And so it, we measured this uh, just before the melt started in 2003. And to get this map, you see a lot of variability of snow water equivalent. To get this map, we had to spend a week uh, in the mountains, uh, about seven or eight of us, measuring the depth of snow and the density of snow of a thousand uh, points in this rugged environment. And then there are also places we couldn't go because it was too dangerous, and then we had to rely on some sophisticated remote sensing technique to get this. So there's a heterogeneous distribution of uh, precipitation. And not only that, it doesn't melt at the same rate because the snow melt in the mountain is dependent on the amount of solar radiation and there's a lot of shading in the mountain. So, for example, this is uh, June 21st, that's the longest day, <coughs> the longest hours of sunshine in the northern hemisphere. And around noon, uh, 1 o'clock, so there's a high variability in radiation. <laughs> So, to get accurate estimate of the precipitation input, mm -hmm. so we had to set up a 25 meter grid in the entire watershed and then run this uh, <coughs> very complex energy balance snow melt model to calculate the snow melt rate every hour on each single cell. And then we added them up for an entire day for the entire watershed. And we got this graph. So it's a lot of work that went in to produce this bars. So the gray is snow melt and blue is rainfall input. And then orange is output. So this is the discharge <coughs> that came out of the stream. So you see that clearly there is an excess input of water uh, in the beginning and excess output of water in the end for the late in the season. So we can plot this as a cumulative uh, graph. So you basically add input and output every day and generate something like this. So the blue is input and the orange is output. There's a clear a delay in output and then at the maximum there was about 100 millimeter of difference between input and output. So that's the groundwater storage, temporary storage of groundwater. 
So basically what it's telling us is that there is a groundwater reservoir, there's a collection of all these sediments, and it has a capacity to store about 100 millimeter of uh, water in what we call active uh, part of the story. So you see that there's a little bulb here. And then underneath there is a stagnant part of the storage. It's not moving very actively, but there is still a storage of water. And there's an exchange of water between active part and the stagnant part. So this active part of the storage is very small. So it's flushed many times in the season, because we get about 900 millimeter of uh, water in the, in the season. So. And then when the fall, so that's end of the warm season, when the fall, fall comes around, the reservoir is always full. So that allows the maintenance of our uh, groundwater flow throughout the winter. Not very large. Uh, at Lake Ohara, we only observe about 0.3 millimeter per day. Uh, but it's large enough to sustain all this ecosystem. So the results of our study is that Groundwater is unimportant, not important at all in the mountains when it comes to modulating the peak flow you know, in summer. Because the capacity is so small to have any impact on the peak flow. However, it is very, very important for sustaining the flow eight months of 12 month year. So, so again, so there is different function of groundwater. So, what we really want to focus on, we need to focus on that the water resource manager is the flow of groundwater in the low flow period. Right? There is no surprise in that, we all know that. <laughs> so it's good to confirm that in the numbers. Now, but again, this is a small research watershed, it's only five kilometers square. No one's interested in that when we talk to the water resource manager. What they're interested in is how this scientific knowledge translate to large river basins for social economically important uh, programs. So we started working on that a few years ago. So this map shows part of the Canadian Rocky Mountains. <coughs> so we have about 18 river basins where our federal <coughs> water agencies have measured the flow over many years. So we selected these 18 river basins. Um, so Unregulated, so we didn't want to have any, any influence of dams. So this river had to have no dams and medium size and a long enough record so we can run statistical analysis. So I'll just show you an example of this particular <coughs> river basin. It's called no substantial river. So we express flow using millimeter per day so that we can compare the behavior of large river basin with a small river basins. And then, so there are 40 lines, 40 gray lines in this figure. Each gray line indicates the response <coughs> of individual year, and the black line is average over 40 years. So, in the summer months, there's a large variability year to year, but then in winter, it seems <coughs> pretty stable. And then, so we calculate the average flow over January and February. We call it uh, winter flow. So in the next graph, I'll show you the change in winter flow from year to year over the last <coughs> several decades. So our expectation going in was that when the climate change, there we will see some effects. <coughs> but this is a meaningful trend in winter flow. And this is just a three examples. Um, so there's no trend. Uh, the winter flow fed by groundwater didn't respond to climate change over the last century, even though the peak flow and total annual flow have changed uh, with the statistical significance. And then there is internal variability. I mean, there seems to be a change from year to year. So I'm going to look at interannual variability in the next. But you know, what was remarkable here, it really surprised us, was that. The only three rivers had a consistent value of winter flow, 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 millimeter per day. So that was the same as what we saw in the small research basin. So there has to be something that keeps this order of magnitude of winter flow. 
Uh, I'll come to that in, in a minute. But so our hypothesis was that okay, well, intra-annual variability in the winter flow is caused by the variability in the rainfall and snowmelt input from the previous year. So you have a wet year, wet summer, and then you have wet winter as well. <coughs> But turns out that there's no correlation. So, the, oh, sorry, the x-axis here is the annual flow from previous year as a proxy or estimate of the wetness of the previous year. And then this vertical axis is the winter flow. So there's a lot of scatter, but there's no correlation. And what this tells us is the reservoir is full in the fall. Because the active part of groundwater storage is so small compared to the snow melt and rainfall input. So we know this of amount of rain and snow melt previous summer. It's always full. That's why we don't have any correlation. So in the next slide, I'll show you the spatial value. So there are 40 blue dots here. And in the next slide, I'll represent all of this using just one dot in the middle of this uh, cloud, so I can show many river movements. So the same thing, annual flow from previous year and winter flow. So this is mean annual flow and mean winter flow for 18 million <coughs> um, So there are different subregions in Canadian countries, <coughs> but they all seem to drop on the uh, linear trend. Uh, so, Wetter regions uh, in the Columbia region of the Rockies, uh, we get a you know, higher amount of uh, winter base flow, and there is no surprise there. But then they seem to all plot on the linear trend. So there are some geological reasons for this, and so we're still kind of <coughs> looking at it. But we wanted to compare our nodes with the colleagues from around the world. So we asked our Chinese colleagues who sent us the data. And these are three rivers from high elevation basins in the western part of China. And we also asked our Spanish colleagues to send us the data from Sierra Nevada in Spain. And they all plot on the same line. So there's something that makes this relationship universal around the world. So, so that's you know uh, something we wanted to uh, explore in the next. So just try to understand the level and the memories. So I'll just summarize my talk using this uh, slide. Uh, so again, this is a picture of the Randolph uh, River hydropower system in Nepal. So this and many other infrastructure depends on the year-round availability of water coming out of the mountains. Now, the work by the last decade or so, not very old, in the past 10 or so years by our colleagues around the world had shown that these coarse geological sediments are the primary reservoir of water in high elevation environments uh, in the mountains. And we also have some ideas about how groundwater functions in this type of uh, sediments. And with this understanding, we can probably construct something the hydrologists would call hydrological parameterization. So let's say you have a small watershed, maybe 10 kilometers squared or 100 kilometers squared. So we try to develop a mathematical function relating the storage of water in the watershed and the amount of flow coming out of the watershed. Considering all this hydrological processes. So once we establish this, and then we can put that into large-scale river basin models to you know, do things that are useful to engineers and water resource managers. So I'd like to conclude my talk with a few thoughts. And it's kind of, I was thinking about students, um, undergraduate and young graduate students. So, this all major research project, you know, we got lots of funding and we spent many years, so many students working on it. It just all started with a little spark of curiosity. 
them. I saw, we saw some of them interesting. So why is this happening? Uh, so when you're young and when you can take a risk, uh, it is really worth pursuing a spark of curiosity. And in order to do that, you don't need a, a expensive instruments or you know, complicated experiments. Uh, just with a simple idea and a simple method, you can gain some meaningful understanding of uh, groundwater. And then this study I presented was only possible because of the collaboration of many people from different disciplines working it together. So I think, you know, from my experience doing science over the last quarter century, uh, so collaboration is what makes the, this scientific study fun. So <clears throat> I'd really like to encourage you to collaborate. And this is the end of my talk, and I'll uh, entertain any questions. Thank you. You have time for some questions, and also I think that Masaki for young students or young researchers can also discuss a little uh, personally if you if you want. Uh, just uh, uh, before uh, going to the questions, I, I want to inform that you really need that you fill up a questionnaire about this presentation. It's part of the NGWA process to to keep uh, them informed about uh, our, our event, that I think that's better for the next year event. And um, uh, because of this, I, I, I uh, well, during the, the, the question uh, uh, process, I, I asked Karim to distribute the, 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 the form to fill up, uh, and after that, just leave the, uh, on, the, on the table. Uh, but I really need this, this type of uh, questionnaire to fill up. Okay. Um, okay. I think that is time for for questions, and uh, you can or share some conclusions or some thoughts. Okay. Who is the first? I don't know if I missed uh, some part of the presentation, but what is the new discharge in those towns? So we were asking the amount of flow discharge coming from our past minutes, but the new discharge if it's similar from Spain, China, and Canada, Example from uh, Peru, 
So there's a lots of pass over 10 kilometer reach. So the total amount of water coming from Paris is enough to own a village. So so it's a, a watershed with yeah. its main access with yeah, yeah. 10 kilometers. Oh, so it's a lot of water. Yeah, it's a lot of water, but you have that long palace here. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the, the ice body inside the, the glacier swamp, uh, they are a source of recharge from the water, in the, mainly in, in the summertime, I believe. Uh, due to the climate change, uh, can influence the body ice inside the glacier swamp to uh, similar is going on in the glaciers. Uh, oh, yes. Well, good question. Uh, the answer is no, because the underground ice has maybe two or three meters of uh, rocks protecting the ice from melting. So eventually it will disappear, but I think it will take many, many years compared to the disappearance of glaciers. Are they representative in the volume um, comparing with the glaciers or, or not? Yeah, again, it depends on the size of the glacier. But the Lake O'Hara basin, for the first example, they're about the same. So there's the same amount of underground ice compared to the glacier. Oh yes. Uh, you mentioned the, the climate change. Do you have any further conclusions about the, the your conclusions on climate change at all? Of the it seems that yeah. Um, the, so the relationship. Yeah. So I, I think that our results support the idea is that the groundwater process is not going to be affected by climate change com compared to glaciers and other parts of the system because of their you know the ability to store up water yes <laughs> sorry at the beginning of the presentation you told us that previously uh, <coughs> Groundwater geologists didn't consider a very significant contribution of groundwater and water from the mountains. And they didn't understand it very well because the rocks are fractured. Mm -hmm. right? So, can the mountains can have fractured right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're totally right. Um, so, the, the question was um, why previous geologists didn't consider the effects of you know, groundwater in the mountains. And um, so the problem reason is we are looking at very high elevation environment. So there's a lot of hydrogeologists who looked at the mountains that have the forests. And then people doing tunnels in these mountains as well. Uh, so I think what we're looking at is the unique part of the environment that's at the very top of the mountains. Yeah, well, high precipitation. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had any experience in South America? Because we have a interesting project in Ecuador. Actually, it's the same, um, but we are not working in so high altitude, but much more. In the, the lower valley, you know, that, uh, but it's basically uh, it's part of the water, and using isotope, you know, that it's part of the recharge, came from the, 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 the glacier that you have on the mm -hmm. top because of very, very right. low signature, and also there's some uh, local precipitation, and uh, actually the water that we have in the valley is a mixture of these mm -hmm. two water. Uh, we, of course, we, we didn't have a, actually a money either time to analyze actually the, the the storage of the water and the time of uh, you know the water that comes from the top to the valley. But uh, 
you have an idea about, uh, you know, because you have the water coming from the top and uh, filling up the, the, the valley of the aquifer, you know, and I know that in the middle, of course, there's much more possibility to have the, the storage and to, to get some retardation of the water or something like this process. I don't have an idea because we are still working in this, in this project. Yeah, so the short answer is no, I've never worked in uh, Latin America, um, but there are people working in high elevation regions in the Peru, Bolivia, and Argentina. I'm not sure about Ecuador. Um, so comparing their results with our results, it seems that they're applicable. That you know the processes are transferable. So you know what you see in the literature from northern hemisphere will probably have some value in, you know, the information has a value in understanding your system as well. But we got to be a bit careful about using isotope to look at the glacier contribution because oftentimes there's no difference between glacier water, glacier meltwater, and snow meltwater because they are from the same sources. Uh, so our watershed, we had a high hopes for using stable isotopes but never worked because there's no difference. Yeah. Masaki. Yeah. It's just a simple question. Uh, is it pre precipitating less in all important mountains of the world? For uh, I, I mean, for uh, uh, for water supply for important cities. So the question is, the precipitation is becoming less in yeah. the mountains. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, in the, again, it's deep. Uh, or recharge. Okay. Yeah. In, in general, uh, precipitation might be increasing. Uh, yeah, at least in Canadian mountains, amount of precipitation is increasing with the climate change. But it's coming down more as rain than uh, the snow. So in the mountainous environment, the form of the precipitation is very important in addition to the, to the amount. So I, you, you can say that the uh, groundwater storage is becoming more important because of this yes. changing. Yeah, you could say that because we get the more rain that flushes up more quickly. Uh -huh. Yeah, that, that's a probably a safe statement. So yes. this, oh, yeah. will this be a problem for for uh, people supplying uh, in the future? Well, so I think what we need to do now is to operate reservoirs uh, differently uh -huh. from uh, ongoing practices. Uh, so if you talk to the water resource manager, there's a way of, okay, well, this is when we want to store more water and then release. Um, so I think they really need to look at the forecast of river flow with climate change. And then, so there could be some conflicting used by different users. Um, so maybe right now the irrigation demand and other demand does not conflict, but in the future two demands might conflict. And then what to do? So I think it becomes more of a social scientific, a political problem, so, uh, not just scientific. Okay, thank you. Yes. <laughs> you showed uh, some numbers for the hydraulic connectivity with yes. a very high number. Yes. But those are to the sediment. I'm guessing that in bedrock, numbers would be even higher. Having said that, uh, if groundwater is frozen, then obviously porosity is very low. It can affect, obviously, the conductivity as well. So I'm guessing that maybe you do not have much flow in the bedrock when you're working at a very low temperature scenario. But with temperature increasing, could we suddenly have a sort of collapse scenario where suddenly that ice melts within the fractures and suddenly hydraulic conductivity really jumps from, you know, already a high number to even higher number, and then this conceptual model where we have sort of dams of groundwater, uh, which are maybe sort of, they hold because the bedrock is actually frozen, suddenly that sort of collapse, and then we have a, a big output of water. Yeah, so the, the places uh, we looked at, um, the, the results we showed, 
So those are not frozen bedrock. Uh, bedrocks are, are not frozen. It just has very low conductivity because of the nature of bedrock. But in places like Switzerland, they are very worried about that. Um, so because they build the, you know, the cable cars and the buildings on the frozen rock, when they are to melt, it creates instability. And so that's an active area of research in uh, Switzerland. <coughs> Yes. So you have a very big change in body. Oh, from ice to water? The moment you melt the permafrost, yeah. uh -huh. you have a sudden change of body. Mm -hmm. So you might, may have different types. Yeah, um, so what we hear about is the uh, frost cracking. Uh, so you have a fracture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I think that in the sediment. more rich. Yeah, yeah. In, the in the sediments. Yeah, I don't know. We don't hear much about liquid fraction. Mm. Partly because these sediments are coarse. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it could happen in fine sediments. Uh, you know, the ones uh, that has a lot of clay or even sand. But our system is a really rocks about you know size of this table and then that's supported by the skeletons. So I'm not sure melting uh, is actually going to cause uh, liquid fraction. It's also high porosity, so the melting ice might actually drain uh, quickly. Oh, oh, oh that's true. Uh, Mother and after the fall. Right, but uh, you said there is no flow, flow from the bedrock. The bedrock is observable. The only thing I write in the first sentence that uh, the water balance. Yeah. So the uh, this Lake Ohara watershed, there is a very little uh, evidence of uh, fractured uh, rock flow uh, because I think it's this particular type of rock. Uh, is very hard, and then that really doesn't produce uh, fractures. But then there are other basins that we are studying. We see evidence of a fractured rock flow over a large distance. So really geology specific, I, I think. Oh, um, uh, first, thanks for your presentation. Uh, make a link with the uh, regardless question. <laughs> I'm always visiting Ecuador next week, mm -hmm. of Quito, and I conclude that Quito is a very interesting hydrogeological area to study. But we don't have much studies yet. And as you know well, Quito is surrounded by volcanoes mm -hmm. with activity, actual and seismic activities nowadays, not, oh. not so much. And it and have also some ice caps. Okay. And I was uh, thinking about some crazy ideas to, to study that. Do you think it's, it's a good um, idea to make some relationship with seismic activities and groundwater discharge? Because physically, if you have some movement, you can generate heat. And the mountain has some fractures and fault, of course. Do you think this movement can create heat enough to uh, have some ice melt? And this groundwater can, uh, can flow through the fractures and nice the discharge? Is it possible to, to think about that? I don't know if the Canadian Black Mountains have some active, seismic activities today. No, not no. in the Canadian world. But my, my first thought is um, amount of the heat generated by the seismic activity <coughs> near the ground surface uh, may be much smaller than other forms of energy, such as solar radiation, uh, and then also the, the temperature is radiant. Uh, but you know, the, 
I, I've been doing 100 yards for 25 years. And then if you measure something, you always discover interesting things. So I, I think if you are able to measure uh, you know, the relevant processes, I think it's probably worth measuring. Yeah? And we also think about the, the, uh, the eruption channel. Oh, okay. A channel that can create much more heat right. and can help to, to melt this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you're talking about heat coming in the form of steam yeah. or something, yeah, that is probably very significant. Yeah. I, I don't know, maybe I like historical data so oh. with the, the seismic uh, data and destruction. Uh, I don't know. They may, and they can make a relationship if there's a I have one question. Yes. Uh, you showed that stratification. You have the ground rock, uh -huh. then you have a layer where the water is concentrated. Mm -hmm. Now, how the other evidences that the physical and also the result of the oxygen, that you have this layer, uh, do you have some prismatic head measures or something like that? Like that. Uh, study this layer of the, of the, of the concentration of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so that particular environment we don't because we cannot drill boreholes uh, to that material. So it's impossible for us to actually install physiometric, uh, physiometer to measure physiometric head. But other traces, uh, we have indirectly estimated the thickness of saturated zone from the hydraulics of the pulse of water traveling through the uh, aquifer materials. So that was, again, indicating similar results. It has to be relatively thin saturated. Do you have any publishers? Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we have published the results, yes. Yeah. Okay, there's some other one there. I recently been in Antarctica, and wow. by far most of the non solid water right. is there, and also <laughs> the North Pole. And only now uh, it's winter up there in, in, the, in the North Pole, but temperatures are around melting uh, temperatures for the first time in the recent record. So I'm just wondering once again if you know these are not places like you mentioned in Switzerland where we're going to see these major major changes, so it's just a, a thought I want yeah, to spare. Yeah. Uh, as I saw there, it, you can see the flow from one day to the other when the sunlight comes out and it really increases. The yeah, it's, it's a dramatic. Uh, so let's say global warming is projected to, let's say over the last hundred years, it warmed about <coughs> one degree all over, you know, areas all over the uh, world. but. The Arctic region has warmed four or five degrees already. And we actually have a study that's looking at northern Arctic permafrost. Changes are just dramatic. It's, it changes every year. Uh, every year, you start seeing more pathways uh, forming with the melt of permafrost. Yeah, it's a very interesting hydrology. Any question? Okay, I. Really want to thank you yeah, again, yeah. Uh, Masaki. It was a really a great pleasure uh, for us, and I think that's a, a good opportunity for us to hear about this different uh, type of challenge for a very tropical country like Brazil. <laughs> but I, I think that many of you know the idea of the plans of the company is to we will have the same same questions sometimes. Different temperature, but perhaps uh, different uh, same ideas, same, same question. And but uh, really, really, really appreciate your your, your talk and your you have been here. Perhaps in the future we can have it for you in a, in a more tropical Brazilian project, perhaps <laughs> or South America project, also. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Coming and to, to really appreciate. Okay, and okay. Bye bye.